The question I'd like to raise in this presentation is whether cognitive therapy truly has an enduring effect that protects patients against subsequent symptom return following successful treatment, or if antidepressant medications are, are iatrogenic in the sense of prolonging the uh, length of the underlying episode. I want to talk primarily about uh, unipolar depression, and uh, depression has a curious kind of temporality to it. Um, the two th biggest aspects that we think of with depression temporality is that, number one, most people who get depressed don't stay depressed forever. It tends to be episodic in nature. And number two, any given episode tends to go away on its own, even in the absence of treatment. That's what we refer to as spontaneous remission. The slide I want to show you first is called The Five R's for Depression. It's one of the most famous slides in the depression literature. It comes from uh, uh, David Kupfer and Ellen Frank. And uh, in this particular slide, I want to call your attention to a couple of things first. Um, number one, I want to talk about the five R's themselves. They're all labeled in white across the uh, top of the uh, slides. Response, remission, relapse, recovery, and recurrence. I'll come back and define each of them in a moment. But number two, I want you to track the two uh, uh, courses of the yellow lines, the solid yellow line and the dashed yellow line. The dashed yellow line uh, represents what is the typical course of an episode of depression, and the solid yellow line where it diverges is what you can do in terms of providing relief uh, from the experience of symptomatology with uh, antidepressant medications. If you go to the far left, an individual starts out in a non-depressed state. If they start to slide into an episode of depression, uh, <clears throat> uh, they're moving from being simply symptomatic into a full-blown episode at the bottom at the trough of the, uh, of the solid yellow line. At this point, things start to diverge. Follow with the dashed yellow line for a moment. If that individual gets no further treatment, chances are they're going to be in episode. They're going to be symptomatic for about the next six to nine months, maybe a little longer, maybe a little less. Uh, but at some point, for most individuals, or for most episodes for any given individual, that uh, those symptoms are going to resolve and the person is going to uh, come out of that episode with depression. We call that spontaneous remission, the lower, uh, uh, the, uh, the green and the lower right. Um, that's one definition of the term remission. That's remission that's achieved without any kind of treatment, and it seems to fit the natural course of depression. Go back now to the trough. Let's follow what happens if somebody were to start getting medicated uh, at the uh, 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 worst of the depression. Uh, that's that, that RX with the blue line coming up. They're going into what we would call acute treatment, and usually within uh, uh, four to six weeks, uh, they're going to have what we would call, uh, actually even within two to three weeks, going to have what we would call a response. That's where they've gotten better. The operational definition of response in the literature is usually a 50% reduction of symptomatology. So they're going to get better in a fairly rapid period of time, but not necessarily fully well. If you continue the line on up, uh, within about uh, two to three months, they're going to uh, enter a state of clinical remission uh, in which they're no longer symptomatic. They're about like what they were before the, uh, uh, the episode started. Now, that's different from the spontaneous remission. They've gotten there uh, with the assist of medications. The thing that we've learned over the uh, uh, last 30 years is that if you get somebody better on medications, you don't stop the medications as soon as they get better. The third R going off to the right is what we call relapse. And uh, if you were to stop medications within uh, the first uh, uh, three to six to nine months of the time the person gets better, they're at very high risk of the depression coming back. Uh, you see uh, in that white uh, tail coming down, we have it as nine times risk. That's nine times risk of the, of the average uh, non-depressed population for the uh, becoming uh, depressed again. What we think is going on is that that individual is still in episode. They may be uh, symptomatically remitted, but they're still in episode. The underlying episode has not yet run its course. What we think is going on with spontaneous remission in the absence of treatment, the dash line, is that uh, over a period of time, the episode does run its course. There's something going on in the individual which uh, uh, brings them back to a non-depressed state even without treatment. And you can, he you, uh, you can speed up the process, you can speed up the uh, time in which somebody's asymptomatic, i.e. in remission, with medications, but you don't necessarily alter the course of the underlying episode. Go to our fourth arm, recovery. Uh, that's really defined by the period of time it would have taken the episode to run its course anyway. Now notice the individual who's in recovery is no less symptomatic than the individual who's remitted. They're both relatively asymptomatic. The difference there is presumably uh, one of risk. If you were to stop the medications after the point of recovery, uh, you might have another episode starting, but the old episode isn't there to come back. We call that new episode starting recurrence. And if you notice in the uh, uh, the tail line there, there an individual who's any individual 
who's ever had a depression in the past is about three times greater risk than anybody else for having a uh, uh, new episode start, having a recurrence. But if you go back to that continuation phase, uh, uh, the odds of a relapse are about three times higher. That's nine times the risk of the general population. What this means theoretically, is there is an underlying episode, which also means there must be mechanisms which drive the underlying episode, which also means that medications do not alter those underlying mechanisms that drive the episode. They suppress the symptoms while somebody's in episode, but they don't take the episode away. That has to run its own course uh, in whatever process it follows. <clears throat> the analogy is to a young child with an ear infection. An infant with an ear infection will be feverish, they'll have some pain, uh, uh, they'll be crying, the parents take them to the pediatrician, the pediatrician puts them on antibiotic, but cautions the parents, don't stop the medication as soon as the child is better. Uh, keep it going for about another seven to 10 days because the good probability that the underlying infection is still in the system, if you stop the medication prematurely, as soon as the symptoms stop, there's a very good chance the underlying infection will reassert itself. That's what we think is going on with relapse. We think the episode is still uh, uh, going on. We think the mechanisms driving the episode are still in place, and that difference between the dashed line and the solid line is the region of risk uh, for symptoms returning, for relapse uh, occurring, because the episode is still going on even though the symptoms have been suppressed. There does appear to be a temporal aspect to risk for depression, uh, such that risk for relapse declines over time, uh, whereas risk for occurrence re remains relatively constant. What we've learned to do pharmacologically is not stop medications uh, while the person's at risk for that relapse, while the episode is still in place, uh, and uh, we have greater uh, uh, confidence, willingness to stop medications after the expected life of the episode. Although I will say in this country nowadays, uh, no good pharmacologist is ever talking with the patient about coming off medications. Uh, uh, we are now increasingly treating depression uh, uh, as if it were an ongoing chronic disorder, much like we would treat diabetes with, uh, with insulin. <clears throat> Let me talk about cognitive therapy. Um, Cognitive therapy is one of several uh, psychosocial interventions which seems to be efficacious in the treatment of depression. There are questions, arguments about just how efficacious it is and whether or not it works for all depressions. The American Psychiatric Association uh, is of the opinion that for more severe depressions, it doesn't even have to be psychotic depression, but more severe major depressions, uh, you really can't get by with just using a psychological intervention like cognitive therapy. You really need to medicate if not to use ECT. Um, colleagues and I, Rob DeRubis, a uh, longtime colleague at the University of Pennsylvania, and each of us with good psychiatric colleagues, uh, Jay Amsterdam at Penn and Rick Shelton at uh, Vanderbilt, were curious about that, curious if that was really true. So what we did was to do a controlled trial uh, where we want to randomize patients to uh, with more severe depressions, the kind of people that the American Psychiatric Association would say shouldn't be uh, capable of responding to cognitive therapy alone. We want to randomize them to cognitive therapy alone. That's the top group, the uh, blue line going across, uh, individual cognitive therapy with a trained cognitive therapist, uh, or antidepressant medications. That's the red line in the middle. For this particular study, we used uh, paroxetine, the uh, SSRI, with the best evidence of uh, efficacy for uh, morally depressed patients. Uh, that was a double side group for reasons I'll tell you in a minute, um, and again carried out for 16 weeks, and or uh, a pill placebo condition. The placebo we only ran for eight weeks. The uh, reason we only ran that for eight weeks is we didn't think we needed to keep patients on placebo uh, any longer in order to document, number one, that the sample was pharmacologically responsive, not all samples are, and number two, that the medication was uh, adequately implemented. Not, it's not always the case. At eight weeks when we broke the blind, uh, patients in the medication condition, the ADM red condition, who hadn't already uh, uh, responded, we did an additional augmentation. We added either lithium or, or uh, dezipramine to the medication, and we used fairly high aggressive doses. We really pushed the limits of really good pharmacotherapy. Uh, notice that the uh, 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 medication placebo comparison was triple blind. Patient didn't know, prescribing clinician didn't know, and an independent evaluator didn't know whether the patient was receiving active medication or not. And of course, the comparison between cognitive therapy and either of the two pill conditions was single blind. Uh, patient would know and therapists would know, but the independent evaluator didn't. Let me show you what found. At eight weeks, we got a nice, good pharmacological effect. Medications beat pill placebo, but just about doubled the response rates, the 50% uh, for the active medications, 25% for the pill placebo. Cognitive therapy, despite what the American Psychiatric Association would have said, did almost as well as the medications. A little bit uh, slower, a little less uh, complete response, but uh, not much far off what the medications were able to do and also was uh, superior to pill placebo. By 16 weeks, you could have graphed the response for uh, cognitive therapy on top of medications. Both uh, active conditions had about a, just under a 60 
50% response rate, good, strong replication of drug placebo differences, and uh, a good, strong indications that cognitive therapy uh, could hold its own with medications in the acute treatment phase. Uh, basically, the question, can cognitive therapy uh, hold its own? Uh, yeah, it can if it's, uh, if it's adequately implemented. Um, now I want to talk about enduring effects. In the same design, I've already talked with you about the first acute treatment uh, phase, the 16 weeks on the far left, there are three conditions. Uh, at the end of the uh, uh, acute treatment phase, those patients who'd responded to the respective modalities, the respective active modalities, if they had been treated with cognitive therapy and got better, we then faded out the cognitive therapy and followed them over the course of the next year. Over that next year, they could only they could have an occasional booster session. We didn't want to stop uh, the contact with the therapist entirely, much like you wouldn't rent out your child's room when he or she goes away to college. Uh, but uh, they weren't continuing in cognitive therapy per se. They could only have uh, a maximum of three sessions over that whole year. They could never have more than one session in a month. We simply wanted to make sure that they weren't staying in cognitive therapy. It's a prior cognitive therapy condition. And most of the patients didn't even use... Uh, all three of the sessions, and only a handful, only a handful did so. Uh, in the folks that got better on medication, uh, we then did a second randomization. Uh, we either kept them on, randomized them to continuation medication, staying on medication, in hopes of preventing relapse, because we thought they were probably still an episode, or we withdrew them onto pill placebo uh, and uh, followed them across the same period of time. Again, triple blind. Notion there is we wanted a control group that ought to show a higher rate of relapse relative to. Pro prior cognitive therapy, if indeed it had an enduring effect or ongoing continuation of medication. The placebo group in the acute treatment phase, no longer relevant for this. We gave them humanitarian treatment, and then, uh, uh, but followed the other, the other responders from the other two groups. At the end of the years uh, of this continuation class slash follow-up, all treatments were stopped for everybody. No more booster sessions in prior CT, no more pills in either the uh, ADM or the placebo conditions, and we followed the folks for another year. By this time, probably looking at the occurrence of, uh, uh, at recurrence as the onset of wholly new episodes as opposed to relapse during that middle phase with the continuation. This is what we got. This is a survival curve, and uh, it starts at the end of the, act of the acute treatment phase, at so the end of week 16, and everybody starts at the top because at this point everybody is remitted. The uh, going down, having the line go down is a bad thing. That means a patient has relapsed. We're looking at time to first relapse as our primary outcome measure. What you can see is the folks that got better on medication who were then withdrawn onto pill placebo, the yellow placebo group, were very uh, likely to, rap to relapse and were likely to do so quite rapidly. Only 20% of them uh, made it through the first year of continuation uh, treatment without having a clinical relapse, and most of those relapses happened early on. The red line are the folks that stayed on continuation medication. That's the standard current standard of treatment in the field. And uh, as you can see, they did considerably better than the folks that were thrown onto pill placebo. They basically uh, uh, doubled the uh, uh, survival rate. The uh, orange line, just to say not everybody who was supposed to stay on medication did, and the four patients that didn't, if they had a relapse, we censored. At that point, it gives you an estimate of what uh, folks would have done if they'd been wholly compliant, a little better, but not uh, not wholly better. But the greatest interest is going to be in the prior cognitive therapy group. Remembering these people did not stay in continuation cognitive therapy. Uh, they only had an occasional boost if they had that at all, and they did considerably better than the folks who got better on medications and then were withdrawn, and uh, visibly better than the folks that uh, were kept on continuation medication. Uh, looking mostly at relapse on the left-hand side of the graph. On the right-hand side, we're getting into the range of recurrences, and although it's a little hard to see on this particular figure, had the same kind of thing happened. Uh, folks who were withdrawn from medication, the continuation medication at that point, were more likely to have recurrences than the folks that had prior exposure. To the subsequent slide shows that. I've now taken everybody at the point of recovery, that second year of the project, and what you can see is we again had a significant difference. Folks with prior exposure to cognitive therapy now over a year ago were much less likely to have a recurrence than folks who were coming off of uh, continuation medication. Pim Kuypers has summarized this very nicely in a, in a meta-analysis. He's looked at the eight trials that have compared prior cognitive therapy with prior medications. Uh, the One of them, the Holland et al., the fourth one down, is the study that I've just shown you. And what uh, Pim found so if you look on the right, uh, these are odds ratios, and uh, to the left hand, uh, uh, dots to the left-hand side indicate an advantage for prior pharmacotherapy. Uh, uh, to the right-hand side is advantage to uh, prior cognitive therapy. The one, the uh, uh, vertical line one represents the splitting of the difference, no difference between the two groups. What you'll see is we had an odds ratio about 2.6. That means we more cut risk of relapse by more than half uh, in prior cognitive therapy as opposed to prior medication. And notice of the eight studies in the literature, seven of the eight basically show that effect. It's significant in six of the eight. That's a very robust finding. It's very unusual to see something that robust in, in the treatment literature. It's it certainly looks like prior exposure to cognitive therapy has an enduring effect that protects patients against some uh, relapse.
in return. We also took a look, PIM also took a look at whether or not uh, prior cognitive therapy held its own with continuation medication, the current standard, and although the differences weren't quite as dramatic there, it mirrored what we saw in the earlier Holland et al. trial, we had an, an odds ratio about 1.6, which means, again, uh, we are reducing risk with exp prior exposure to cognitive therapy, even over keeping people on continuation medication, the current best that we know how to do in the bottom line, we think, is it certainly looks like there's an enduring effect for cognitive therapy. Uh, prior exposure to cognitive therapy helps protect people against subsequent symptom return and does so certainly better than uh, prior exposure to medication and maybe even better than uh, keeping folks on continuation medication. And that second year of our follow-up suggests that it might even extend to the prevention of recurrence instead of wholly new episodes. Mediation. Uh, we know a bit about mediation. It's always easier to detect an effect than it is to explain it, and it's probably going to be easier to uh, determine what the mediators are for uh, preventative effects than they are for acute treatment effects just because you don't have to worry as much about the temp confounds. But let me show you a slide that uh, uh, was contributed by Helen Mayberg. Very grateful to her for uh, uh, providing this to me. Uh, Helen's done some marvelous studies looking at uh, patients treated uh, to remission with either cognitive therapy or medications, and what she finds is basically this. You get specific changes uh, in the brain for folks treated to remission with medications relative to cognitive therapy in uh, the brain stem and the limbic system. The orange and the red circles are the areas that seem to control the mood state, salience motivation, interception, and they are usually uh, uh, lower brain and, and mid -brain and the limbic uh, system uh, uh, areas of, uh, of uh, uh, functioning. Uh, cognitive therapy, to the extent it shows uh, specific differences to pharmacotherapy, those specific differences happen uh, in areas that control cognition and self-awareness insight, the blue and the light blue. Those are usually higher cortical processes. What it looks like is medications, when they work, work from the bottom up, and uh, cognitive therapy, when it works, from the top down. Now, we don't know if... Uh, <coughs> These uh, differences are the things that actually, uh, the, the, the changes at the cortical level, the things that actually mediate cognitive therapies and during effect. What Helen hasn't done is to follow their samples up to see if it accounts for differential relapse over time, but that's exactly where we'd want to start looking. Those would be the high probability uh, uh, suspects available. So basically, uh, it looks like brainstem and limbic system are the primary loci for specific effects relevant to medications, and cortical activation seems to be the thing that seems to be carrying the day for cognitive therapy, as best we can currently tell. I now want to talk about a really uh, marvelous program of research that has been conducted by Steve Mayer at the uh, University of Colorado. Uh, uh, Steve was, uh, was one of the original developers to learn helplessness phenomena. He and Marty Seligman together uh, developed that uh, process. But what Mayer has done over the last 10 years, 10, 15 years, is focused not just on learned helplessness, the acquisition of uh, a depression-like phenomena uh, uh, as a consequence of exposure to uncontrollable stressors. He's also invested in what he now calls learned resilience, the notion that you could make organizations organisms uh, more competent by exposure to escapable things. The basic helplessness design is as follows. On the far right, you've got an animal that's a control animal that's not exposed to shock at all. It's put in the, put in the uh, apparatus, it's got a wheel it can turn, it's got uh, its tail hooked up, but there's no shock being delivered to the tail. On the far left, you've got an animal that's going to be exposed to escapable stressors, controllable stressors. Uh, it's got a wheel it can turn, the wheel will turn off the shock when the shock starts. Its tail is hooked up so it does get shocked, uh, so it gets exposed to stressors, but it's capable of exercising control over that, uh, that electric shock, that particular stressor. In the middle is the animal that's going to be made helpless. This is the animal who is yoked to the animal on the far left. It gets shocked at exactly the same time. The shock turns off at exactly the same time. It gets exactly the same amount of uh, electric shock as the animal on the far left. However, it has no control. It's the animal on the left that's controlling the offset, not the animal in the middle. And what we find is it's the animal in the middle that develops the learned helpless phenomena, the behavioral activity, the inability to learn in new uh, 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 situations, uh, the, uh, uh, all the things that look to be hallmarks of depression. It's a very good experimental animal paradigm. It's one we even use now to screen for new uh, potential antidepressant medications. It looks like it's a good behavioral analog for depression. The animal on the far, we, we've, we've known for 20, uh, 30 years that the animals in the middle, the ones that are made helpless, uh, seem to learn that they can't exercise control, so they don't try. We never paid much attention to the animals on the far left until Mayer uh, revisited the paradigm. And what he's discovered is it's not just that they're not affected by the stressor, they're actually made more resilient by the stressor. In subsequent situations, testing situations, they perform better than the control animals on the far right. We always knew the animals in the middle performed worse. What Mayer's learned is the animals on the far left perform even better. They learned, actually, it's not that they don't not that they're, they're learning neutral, they learn that they can exercise control, and that's a good thing that serves them well in subsequent situations.
Bayer has done something more. He's tracked down the neural wiring diagrams for both of those uh, patterns. And what we have on the first slide on the bottom is the dorsal raphe nucleus. That's the uh, uh, collection of, uh, 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 of uh, cell bodies in the brain stem uh, that are all the cells in the brain that use serotonin as a neurotransmitter. Of course, as you know, serotonin is one of the primary uh, uh, neurotransmitters we think is involved in depression. So the dorsal raphe nucle nucleus is going to be a uh, key for us. The 5-HT, those little red globs of the 5-HT, those are the uh, uh, serotonin neurons themselves, the cell bodies, and they're going to project out to the limbic system, to the, uh, including the amygdala, to uh, the cortex, widely throughout the brain. We're going to come back and talk about that in a few minutes. But what he's also learned is that uh, when you expose animals to uncontrollable stressors, it's the dorsal raphe nucleus which lights up. There are probably other areas of the brain like the amygdala that let it know that it ought to be lighted, but that lights up. And then it coordinates a uh, essentially a stress response, uh, fight, flight, uh, and other kinds of responses uh, throughout the brain. Uh, the other area that's going to be central for this particular story is what lights up for the animals that learn resilience, the animals on the far left that expose to controllable situations. Those animals, uh, when they're exposed to stressors, uh, but they have control, that activates the ventromedial prefrontal cortex in the cortex. The cortex has a descending inhibitory pathway, uh, which synapses on GABA in the dorsal raphe nucleus. GABA itself is inhibitory. So when the ventromedial prefrontal cortex fires, it turns down the dorsal raphe nucleus. Uh, in a sense, it turns off the stress response or greatly inhibits the stress response. Uh, what that uh, what that likely means is that the animals uh, in the helpless condition, the middle cell, are, uh, are responding to stress the way nature intended them to do, and the animals on the far left with the learned resilience are not responding to stress. It's as if the cortex is telling the limbic system, don't worry about this, we got it handled, we can deal with this, we know how to turn it off. Look at it even a step further. He's done some marvelous experiments where he's manipulated the wiring diagrams, the wiring mechanisms. Uh, if you use a topical application to block the impulse from the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which happens to be glutamatergic, if you block that uh, uh, neuron from firing, uh, you turn the resilient rats, you make the resilient rats act as if they were helpless. Even though they were trained, exposed, in controllable situations, they don't act like they were. They act like the animals in the middle that uh, were exposed to uncontrollable stressors. If you force the glutamatergic uh, descending pathway to fire you know, using a topical application, you make the helpless rats look like they're resilient. He's uh, done a marvelous job of manipulating the presumed mechanisms uh, in both directions, and it really increases our confidence that that's the, these are the mechanisms that lie behind the, uh, uh, the learned helplessness and, and, the, and the learned resilience, or at least the learned resilience in particular here. Additional feature, which is of interest to us, is what he would call behavioral immunization. If you expose an animal to ex to uh, escapable stress, the controllable stress on the far left, that's what the ES stands for, even a week later, you can expose it to inescapable stress, the kind of thing that usually produces a helpless phenomena, and it's protected against that. Prior exposure to control leads an animal to act as if it has control well beyond you would typically what you would typically expect it to have. It looks like you get an enduring effect for learned resilience, which looks for all the world like the enduring effect that we get in cognitive therapy. You've got a couple of parallels here. You've got probably largely cortical uh, activation uh, that seems to be uh, uh, as a consequence of uh, 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 being able to uh, control uh, uh, exercise control over your environment, and it seems to inhibit stress responsivity when you run into bad things that happen to you. Uh, the parallels are just really quite striking. The thing to point out, Mayer notes that uh, the implication is that the medial prefrontal cortex activation becomes tied to the stressor if the organism has initial experience with the stressor that's controlled. That's all very nice. Now the question is, is it the stressor itself, the shock, or is it the beginning of the uh, uh, stress response that you get to the shock that's key? And um, the exposure to the stressor later activates the medial prefrontal cortex. And again, the question is, is it just having the electric shock turn on or is having the start of the stress response that makes a difference? Because that's going to have implications for what happens when you combine cognitive therapy with medications. And the concern here is that uh, uh, if you don't get a bit of a stress response uh, to respond to, will it be anything to turn on your, your sense that you're going to have control? There's not a little bit of a flutter there. Is there something to turn that on? And if you uh, medicate, uh, are you maybe taking away the capacity for a... Uh, uh, an enduring, of, uh, a enduring response from uh, uh, the uh, uh, cognitive therapy. Brings us to our next question. Does combined treatment with medications undercut the enduring effect for CBT? Um, and if it does, does it do so for psychological or biological reasons? The most recent study that Rob and I and our psychiatric colleagues have done has been a, a three-site study that Penn, Vanderbilt, and then Rush Medical Center in Chicago. And here we want to 
take a look at uh, the long-term prevention of recurrence, not simply rely on a, on a follow-up from a uh, short-term acute treatment trial. We want to treat patients uh, either with medications alone or with combined treatment. We want to keep the two conditions as uh, similar as possible. That's why we didn't have a cognitive therapy alone condition, but we wanted to see if adding cognitive therapy to medications uh, provided a preventative boost down the line. Uh, we treated folks, patients not just for a fixed period of time. We treated them to a fixed outcome as long as it took uh, and uh, to remission. And by remission, we were defining this four weeks without uh, 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 major symptomatology. Once they're in remission, we kept them in treatment until they met criterion for recovery, which is at least six months without relapse. We wanted to get them past the point where they were probably still an episode to where any new uh, onset of symptoms would be the onset of a wholly new episode and not the return of the last one. At the point that patients were in full recovery, we then did a second randomization. We faded out the cognitive therapy for anybody that was in the top uh, uh, condition and uh, either kept them on maintenance medication for the next year or withdrew medications. And in the bottom condition, the folks had never had exposure to cognitive therapy, we did the same thing again. We kept them on maintenance medications or withdrew them from medications. This is what we got. The left half of the graph shows our uh, rates of recovery over that uh, 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 acute and continuation phase. What you see is we had a nice modest boost uh, for combined treatment over medications alone, about a 10% increment from 63% up to 73%. But things get really interesting when we look to the right, that uh, divided line. Now is where we start taking the treatments away, cognitive therapy taken away entirely, and folks are either randomized to uh, maintenance medication. Uh, if they had prior exposure to cognitive therapy, it's the solid blue line for maintenance medication. If uh, uh, we're taking the medications away in the prior cognitive therapy condition, it's the dash blue line. If uh, we're keeping maintenance medication going in the medication-only condition, it's the solid red line. And if we're taking the medications away, it's the dash red line. What we expected is that the dash blue line would be sitting somewhere between the two solid lines that prior exposure to cognitive therapy uh, would do at least as well as uh, may, would do about as well as maintenance medication um, even once you took medications away and that's not what we got um, we got a good, strong maintenance medication effect but very little evidence of an enduring effect for cognitive therapy at all we were quite surprised about that Compare that to the kind of studies I showed you earlier. On the left-hand side, we had the Holland et al. trial and also data from the Dobson uh, et al. trial done in Seattle. Very similar. We pulled the two data sets together. What you can see there is that in terms of sustained recovery, the proportion of folks who get through uh, the uh, uh, second year of follow-up without having a relapse uh, uh, or a recurrence is considerably greater in prior cognitive than in prior medication. If you get cognitive therapy alone without combining with medication, you get a good size uh, preventative effect with respect to recurrence, at least in our earlier trials. Uh, on the right-hand side of this data I just showed you from this most recent trial where people got cognitive therapy in a combination with medication, we virtually wipe the effect out. That's what makes us a bit nervous that combining medications with cognitive therapy uh, might wipe out the enduring effect for cognitive therapy. There's a precedent for that. Dave Barlow did a marvelous trial, and colleagues did a marvelous trial uh, published back in 2000 in the PANIC literature. Uh, in PANIC, CBT uh, also seems to have an enduring effect that protects against the return of uh, uh, PANIC disorder once you get, have been successfully treated. On the far right, you have a CBT alone condition. These are folks who all got better. Now we're looking at rates of relapse after uh, treatment is terminated. On CBT alone, uh, we had under 20% relapse. If you look at the uh, uh, second from the left, the imipramine alone uh, condition, that's the medication condition condition, much higher rate of relapse there. So prior cognitive therapy uh, was far superior to prior medication treatment after treatment was terminated in reducing risk for subsequent uh, 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 relapse in panic patients. Now, the two interesting, even more interesting conditions come from the uh, far left where we have the cognitive therapy combined with medications and mepramine. There, even though those folks got cognitive therapy, they did no better than the folks got medication on also a very high rate of recurrence. Uh, very similar to what we saw in that most recent trial I just showed you with our depressed patients where the combination looked like it wiped out the enduring effect for cognitive therapy. The other centrist is the second from the right. That's cognitive therapy combined with pill-placebo. Notice that there, even though those folks thought they were on uh, a continuation medication, uh, it didn't interfere with cognitive therapy's enduring effect. Uh, they did every bit as well in terms of uh, 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 rates of, uh, of uh, uh, lower rates of, of relapse after treatment termination as the folks with cognitive therapy alone. What this, no doubt, what this probably means is that uh, not only does cognitive therapy for panic disorder have a uh, relapse prevention effect uh, that you don't find from medications, but it gets wiped out if you combine it with medications if it's the active pharmacological agent. It's not enough to think that you're taking medications. You need to actually have the medication in the system, which gets us back to our notion that we might have to be a little concerned about medications taking away that beginning a bit of a stress response. Um, 
Does uh, combined treatment with medications undercut the uh, enduring effect for cognitive therapy? Well, it's possible that it might, and if it does, it might be either type of me mechanism, although Barlow's data would suggest it's uh, particularly likely to be the pharmacologically active ingredient in the medication that uh, carries that effect. <clears throat> All that being said, we have in the depression literature have no single study that's done this on an experimental basis, and one of the studies we'd like to do is essentially replicating Barlow's design in a uh, major depressed population. Uh, at the bottom, we'd have a group of patients uh, brought to remission on uh, antidepressant medications, and at the top, we'd have a group of patients brought to remission on cognitive therapy, the standard kind of thing that I showed you earlier in the uh, Holland trial and the, and the other subsequent trials. But we'd also have the two uh, combined treatment groups, the, bar, uh, the second from the bottom, the cognitive therapy combined with active medications, the two solid lines, and then the uh, second from the top, the cognitive therapy combined with pill placebo, where people think they're getting medication, but they're actually not. We treat folks to remission, stop all of the treatments and follow across time. And if you look at the three boxes on the lower right-hand side, if cognitive therapy has an enduring effect and medication has no particular effect on subsequent course, then what you would expect is cognitive therapy or cognitive therapy combined with pill placebo or cognitive therapy combined with medication ought to show a lower rate of relapse than medication alone. It's the medication group only that ought to have the higher rate of relapse. If we got what Barlow got, was that medication interferes with cognitive therapy's enduring effect for biological, pharmacological reasons, then we would expect either the patients treated to remission with cognitive therapy or cognitive therapy combined with pill placebo to do considerably better than the folks who got medication either with cognitive therapy or on its own. If that's a, a pharmacological mechanism, that's undercutting the efficacy of uh, the enduring effect of cognitive therapy. If it turns out that it's a psychological mechanism recovered there as well, and only cognitive therapy ought to show the reduction in uh, rates of relapse, and anybody who either is getting medication or thinks they're getting medication, whether they're getting cognitive therapy or not, ought to show the higher rates of rel relapse. An eminently testable uh, uh, set of hypotheses. Now, let me take this further. Um, there is reason to be concerned that medications might have an atrogenic effect that um, suppress symptoms over the short run, but do so at the expense of prolonging the life of the underlying episode. And let me tell you where that comes from. Uh, back in 2010, an uh, uh, investigative journalist named Robert Whitaker did a book that caused quite a stir. It got a lot of bit of attention. And what Whitaker was basically generally titled Anatomy of an Epidemic, he pointed out a couple of things which are clearly established facts. When we've had a real explosion in the number of folks who were put on uh, uh, disability for psych psychiatric reasons since the uh, in the ten five decades since the anti uh, uh, antidepressants antipsychotics were introduced, you would have expected lower rates of uh, of disability, lower rates of onsets of disorder. If anything, they've mushroomed. It's questions as to why that is, and there's an alternative explanation. It might just be we're becoming more liberal in how we're uh, 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 in how we're uh, laying out disability criterion, but. The phenomena is is the case that disability rates are higher. Second thing that uh, uh, Whitaker pointed out is unmedicated patients in naturalistic studies do better than the patients get medicated. Now, of course, as an alternative explanation, it might just be that it's the sicker patients, higher risk get medicated anyway. Third thing, prognosis used to be better. Remember we described earlier how depression was classically thought of as being episodic but self-limiting. We just don't talk about that much anymore. And it may be that uh, the whole course of this order is coarsened. Now, it also may be on the right-hand side that our earlier methods were less precise. We were missing things that were actually happening. Fourth thing down, medications appear perhaps to worsen the course. Again, uh, nowadays, very few good pharmacotherapists will ever talk with a patient about coming off a of medication once they get them stabilized. In the old days, we didn't do that. Uh, and it, on the other hand, it could just be that withdrawal of medication anytime you do it unmasks the disorder that's waiting there to emerge. Uh, uh, to emerge. Fifth thing is pediatric bipolar is a relatively new disorder. 15, 20 years ago, we didn't have case reports of that. Now we have it, and it coincides with the use of antidepressant medications with pre-adolescent children who may be at risk. Maybe something about the medications driving that. Now, on the right-hand side, all of these things have alternative explanations, but they each require a different explanation. On the left-hand side, uh, Whitaker's concerned that medications may have iatrogenic effects. That's a single parsimonious explanation, and science has not been kind uh, to... Uh, uh, non-parsimonious explanations. If Whitaker's right, we could be creating and worsening disorders, uh, getting short-term symptom reduction at the expense of long-term coarsening and worsening. If he's wrong, we may be driving people, frightening people away from medications that they could literally, uh, they could. So the, if the question is, uh, could we have an atrogenic effect that worsens the course of the illness? Is there something about what's going on with the medications that blocks the counter-regulatory homeostatic processes 
uh, that when the past would have led to spontaneous remission, or is it just an artifact of the way we're uh, 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 altering our public policy in detail? I want to talk about one last uh, set of uh, ideas and notions. This comes from Paul Andrews, an evolutionary psychologist at uh, McMaster. He's got some really fascinating ideas. We've often been curious as to whether or not depression has an adaptive function. It's hard to imagine something that's that uh, uh, common. It's 20% uh, uh, of all women, 10% of all men are going to be depressed at some point in their life without uh, having uh, some kind of uh, role that it plays. And what uh, doesn't mean it does, but it, there's some possibility there. And what uh, uh, Andrews has done is laid out what happens when uh, you have serotonergic activation in the brain, because that tends to be one of the things that happens that underlies most depressions. Remember the dorsal raphae nucleus is the, uh, is the uh, area in the brainstem that contains all of the nucleus in the brainstem that contains all of the uh, cell bodies for neurons that use serotonin as a neurotransmitter. So when the dorsal raphae nucleus gets activated, it's going to have an effect on a number of different high, higher level regions in the brain. It's going to affect the amygdala, uh, and it's going to affect the amygdala in a way which uh, uh, turns attention, is directed towards current problems, threats in the environment. It's going to affect the hippocampus in a way that allocates working memory to existing current problems, and it's going to reduce BDNF signaling. That's the uh, uh, process that uh, uh, leads to neural regeneration and uh, tissue regrowth. It's going to affect the lateral uh, prefrontal cortex in a way that makes it resistant to distraction and keep it focused on whatever the current life problem is. It's going to affect the nucleus accumbens in ways which reduce interest in other things. It's going to lead to an an amotivational anhedonic state, it's you're not going to be spending your time pursuing other uh, sources of reward. You're going to be focusing on the thing that you're dealing with at the moment, and it's going to affect the hypothalamus in a way that turns down growth, turns down reproduction, turns down physical activity. What uh, Andrew suggests is that the primary uh, function of serotonin in the brain is not so much to regulate mood, it's to regulate energy allocation between competing demands on resources. And he would say that when you're depressed, you usually have complex problems you need to solve. And what it basically does is it keeps you in the head to give you a better shot at solving those complex problems rather than engaging in an environment which may not be very reinforcing at that point in time. Thanks. Again, elegant stuff is that we still don't know exactly how it is that medications work when they work, but we have certain notions which are probably not true. Uh, the notion that there's a deficit in these neurotransmitters that's corrected by the medication, clearly that's not the case. Nobody in 30 years has ever found a deficit. But take a look at the four uh, 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 sets of uh, neuron relationships. This is the second most, uh, the other of the two famous uh, uh, slides in the depression literature. This is called the uh, NIMH neuron. On the left hand side, we have the presynaptic neuron. This is a serotonergic neuron arising from the uh, raphae, uh, dorsal raphae nucleus, and it's projecting then into various areas of the brain. Might be the uh, limbic system, might be the cortex, etc. Uh, in a non-depressed equilibrium, uh, you've got the serotonin as a neurotransmitter being released into the synapse. It gets picked up on the postsynaptic side and uh, could be any of a number of different neurotransmitters. Often it's a uh, uh, glutamatergic neurotransmitter, glutamatergic is activated, and you've got an equilibrium there. That's the way the person is, that's what the person's like when they're not depressed. When they're depressed, they they shift to new equilibrium. What you have is a lot more activation of the uh, uh, dorsal raphae nucleus, a lot more serotonergic activity. More serotonin gets released into the synapse. That produces more activation on the uh, glutamatergic side of things. So you get more glutamatergic glutamatergic activity in those neurons with all the various consequences that we just showed you in the previous slide. Um, if you start a person on antidepressant medications, particularly on the SSRIs that are uh, specific to uh, serotonin, you're going to get short-term changes and long-term changes. The acute uh, changes you're going to get in the neurons over the first seven to ten days is a uh, real push, a real activation uh, activation of the serotonin in the synapse. You're going to shift the balance from intracellular uh, storage of serotonin in the uh, in the presynaptic neuron to push it out into the, uh, and you're going to have more of it concentrated in the synapse. You're going to get that because what the SSRIs do is they block reuptake. If you see the little serotonin uh, transporter at the lower left-hand side of the presynaptic uh, uh, terminal, that gets blocked by the medications. They gum that up. It leaves more of the serotonin floating around uh, in the uh, synapse. What that means is you're going to push the activation of the glutamatergic postsynaptic neurons even more so than you did when uh, you were at depressed equilibrium. Now that's kind of curious and kind of paradoxical. If the initial effect of medications is to push the organism even further away from a normative uh, uh, non-depressed equilibrium, it's as if you ought to be expecting that you're making the situation worse. And indeed you do. You generally get a uh, short-term, a short-lived increment in symptomatology over that first week to 10 days. What then happens with chronic application is two additional things occur.
You get downregulation via homeostatic mechanisms. In the presynaptic neuron, you get inhibition of synthesis of serotonin, so less gets produced. There's less available to be uh, uh, pushed out into the synapse, and you don't have to worry as much about not being able to t take it up into the neuron. And on the postsynaptic side, uh, you get tonically active, tonic activation of the 5-HTA1A uh, uh, receptor, which which turns down the sensitivity of the glutamatergic neurons. So if you, if the typical thing that happens in depression is serotonin becomes, uh, uh, raphenucleus fire serotonin becomes more active, drives more glutamatergic activity, uh, what, the, what the SSRIs do is block reuptake that keeps more serotonin in the synapse, which is paradoxical because it ought to make the situation even worse, which it does briefly, but then it activates homeostatic mechanisms which work in a counter-regulatory way to bring the serotonin back down, uh, the transmission of the whole system back down to something closer to what would be at a non-depressed equilibrium. What that is like, it's analogous to holding a match up to a thermostat to turn down a furnace, where essentially uh, triggering internal homeostatic mechanisms to action before they typically would by driving the, the system further out of equilibrium, and that's basically what we do with, the, uh, with these kinds of medications. Now, what we don't know is what the mechanisms are that drive spontaneous remission. We know in the past, when folks weren't medicated, they would get over these depressions anyway. We know that the medications do nothing to turn off the, the mechanisms that are driving the underlying episode. That's because we have to keep folks on medication during the life of the episode. We don't know what's responsible for eventually turning the, the uh, episode off, but we do know that we're perturbing the system in a way that could have profound implications. Now, Whitaker is concerned about are a consequence of exactly this kind of uh, 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 this kind of uh, uh, homeostatic uh, counter-regulatory counter, counter -regulatory homeostatic action. The thing that we could do to test this notion is the kind of design as follows. What we need to do is have a uh, a non-specific inert placebo condition. Folks are treated with pill placebo, and they're going to be compared to folks treated with active medication and folks treated with cognitive therapy. At the bottom, we put people on antidepressant medications, treat them not just to remission, but all the way through to recovery, so we're protecting them against relapse. At the top, we treat people with cognitive therapy to remission, keep them in continuation to the point of recovery, but we also have patients that we treat on pill placebo. And it turns out that's not that uh, uh, difficult a thing to do eth ethically. About half the patients who meet criteria for major depression do, do not show a differential response to medications as opposed to pill placebo, and it has to be more severe before you're going to start seeing that happening. And for the more severe half, only about half of them show a differential response, so that uh, uh, essentially three quarters of the response you get to medications you get from pill placebo alone, and so we'd have to push a few more folks into that condition. But by and large, if we provide good humanitarian, tr humanitarian treatment for those four for that quarter of the patients at our disadvantage, we could get three quarters of our sample out uh, into the subsequent uh, uh, state of recovery and then follow across time. Once in recovery, we follow across time, and the following things ought to happen. If, and look in the lower box on the right, if prior cognitive therapy really has enduring mechanisms which it sets in place, akin to uh, Steve Mayer's learned resilience, then it ought to have an enduring effect, and those patients who were treated to remit recovery with prior, co prior cognitive therapy ought to be less likely to have subsequent recurrences, onset of new episodes than the folks who got there with a uh, uh, theoretically, specifically inert pill placebo. Conversely, if antidepressant medications have an atrogenic effect, which uh, screws up the uh, counter-regulatory uh, mechanisms which uh, uh, account for remission, then what ought to happen is those folks who got brought to recovery on medications ought to have be more likely to have recurrences than the folks that got there on pill placebo. We can think of a design which would cleanly let us know uh, whether cognitive therapy is truly enduring, has a mechanisms that truly have a positive effect, or if medications have an atrogenic effect, have a, medications which have long-term negative uh, atrogenic effects, and and we could superimpose any number of, uh, of uh, imaging and uh, uh, information processing and other kinds of uh, studies on top of this kind of design to relate the question. Summary conclusions for all of this. There are temporal aspects to depression uh, that make it episodic and self-limiting. It's not clear why the episode ends on its own spontaneous remission, and uh, it's possible that we are ignoring our, uh, we're, we're not attending to that at our own peril. Cognitive therapy clearly reduces risk for relapse relative to medications. Uh, we don't know exactly why or which it is, but it clearly there's a difference between the two when you get successful treatment, and there are reasons to be concerned that adding medications may interfere with that cognitive therapies effect. Although we don't know that for, that for sure, the indications are, are quite suggestive. Depression appears to have coarsened since the advent of the uh, antidepressant medications, and uh, the kind of thing Whitaker points out and others point out, and it could be that medications work to suppress symptoms, a good thing, via 
uh, the process of prolonging the underlying episode, which would be a bad thing. We may be uh, getting benefit in the short term at our cost in the long term, which may be why we're having so much trouble getting patients off of medications nowadays in ways that uh, we hadn't really anticipated. Finally, it's unclear if cognitive therapy is enduring or antidepressants or antigenic, but we can identify the kind of designs with nonspecific uh, uh, controls that would resolve the issue with respect to either or both. I'll stop at this point and the reference for those of you all that want to follow those. Thank you very much.